Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second installment of Lincoln Center Originals Songwriters. My name is Jeff Blumenkrantz, and I was very lucky to have been one of the songwriters to have been asked to write a song for Lincoln Center Original Songwriters Part 1, and I am doubly honored to have been asked by the co-producers and directors, Lonnie Price and Matt Cowart, to be your host tonight. Um, I wanted to take a minute to talk about this incredible space for the benefit of the people who are not here but are watching online. We are in the David Rubenstein Atrium, which is a space that extends from Broadway to Columbus between 62nd and 63rd Street in New York City. And it's a space with incredibly high ceilings and a great feeling of openness where you can do things like buy discount tickets to Lincoln Center events. You can get Tom Colicchio food at Witchcraft. You can enjoy free Wi-Fi and bathrooms. And you can also come see free shows like this one here tonight. So, Lincoln Center Originals is a program spearheaded by Jed Bernstein, the president of Lincoln Center, um, and the notion behind it is to create work that reflects the Lincoln Center campus and to explore that work with the artists that created it. This series has already featured plays and dance pieces inspired by Lincoln Center, but tonight we celebrate songs. Lonnie and Matt have asked some of their favorite composers and lyricists of the theater to come up with songs, real or fictional, inspired by what goes on at Lincoln Center. And here we go. I left my next card at my chair, so I'll be right back. Our first writer tonight <laughs> is Justin Levine. He is a composer lyricist whose favorite writing projects include Bonfire Night, Tell Me Tomorrow, Jump Jim Crow, and Halfway Home. But you might have also caught him wearing some other hats, namely music director, orchestrator, and or actor for Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson, both on and off Broadway, as well as Murder Ballad at Manhattan Theater Club, Here Lies Love at the Public, and Love's Labor's Lost at Shakespeare in the Park. And here he is to sing Meet Me in the Square. Hello. The Manhattan Indians, they welcomed Verrazano with a smile. An Italian sent by France to see if buying was worthwhile. Then the Dutch came in and mapped it out and said it's worth a dram. Paid 20 bucks, called it New Amsterdam. And as the years went by, this town became the glory of this land. And its power moved from king to boss, to mayor, banker, hand to hand. They say this town ain't big enough for little guys like me. The things that make this city what it is ain't even close to free. So New York ain't what it used to be, at least that's what they say. Everybody keeps on telling me the best of times were yesterday. But all this speculation and the way they say it was don't mean a thing to me and that's all because I may not have a nickel or a dime, but still I know how to show you a good time. You and me can make ridiculous sublime if you just meet me in the square. Just find a spot to lay a blanket down, and then we got the greatest show in town, whether it's tour and dot or that sad Italian clown, you just come meet me in the square. Someday, maybe we could go inside and listen to the music from a seat. Never been guilty of having too much pride. So for me, I'll just be happy listening on the street. I can hear it now. Who needs 
needs to dine on big ceramic plates. An hour in line, then a snooty waiter waits. As long as we can just listen to the greats, then it's a date. Then it's a date at Lincoln Square. Then it's a date at Lincoln Square. So the Brits came in and liked this town and named it for a duke. Was it planned how fast it all expanded? Was it just a fluke? But we are here, and what is clear, that's always going to be. This open square, this flowing fountain, watching Moses top the mountain. Verdi, Mozart, Bach, Puccini, Audra, Patti, Tuscanini. Culture costs an arm and leg, but there's no need to scrape and beg so long as you just meet me in the square. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> OK, so in September, you get a phone call. Mm -hmm. Justin, would you write a song inspired by Lincoln Center? What happened next? What happened next was I actually originally, the, the first thought I had, because I, I didn't even know that the, the fictionalization option was there. So I just started thinking of, you know, I, I grew up on Long Island and came you know, to see shows at Lincoln Center ever since I was a little kid. And so I started to think, oh, you know, which, which experience you know, was I going to write about? And I actually thought of this time when I went to see Tosca uh, it was the Zeffirelli production, and you know it's that incredible moment when the curtain comes up and you see this set that's you know the fiberglass and it looks so real. You're in this cathedral, and um, you know the whole audience gasped. I'd, I'd, I'd never heard someone gasp at design before. You know, at the top of a show. Um, so I was thinking about that, and, and when I went to see it, I, I was lucky enough uh, for reasons that I won't bore anybody with, but I got to sit in that presidential box, that central box, right, the fancy box. And so next to me was um, Cardinal Egan was sitting in the box right next to me, and so we were sharing an armrest, and we had this sort of awkward thing where we were fighting, and this whole thing was happening, and then finally we made peace because he didn't know how to use the translator, you know, the, the subtitle thing, because you have to wait a second because there's a system that has to load and all this stuff, and so I just sort of gently said, it's all right, you know, showed him. <laughs> so I didn't write that song. Um, I, I tried, and I, you know, just thought, well, you know, I don't really know. There's, there's a story there, but is there a song there? And then... Um, I thought about when uh, my girlfriend and I, we went to see uh, uh, Aida in, in the square. You know, they were doing the, the broadcast. And I was just thinking about, you know, we, we sat on the floor because we got there late, so we didn't have any space. But we just sat there and, you know, ate sandwiches from a bag. And I just thought, this is like one of the coolest things you can do in New York. And it doesn't cost a penny. And so that's where it came from. Yeah, it was the perfect song to start this event because here we are free and enjoying incredible talent Absolutely. like yours. So Absolutely. congratulations. Oh, thank and you. Thanks for that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I have all the cards now. <laughs> Next up, we have composer, lyricist, and performer Nick Blameyer. Nick has written the book, music, and lyrics to four original musicals which have been produced at Williamstown Theatre Festival, Kansas City Rep, Barrington Stage Company, and DC's Signature Theatre. At 23, he made his Broadway debut writing the score for Glory Days, which has gone on to receive over 30 productions worldwide. As a performer, he has been seen on Broadway in Godspell and Crybaby, Cry and off-Broadway in Dogfight and this past season's Found. Here is Nick Blameyer singing The Lincoln. So uh, this song uh, is about my first date with my wife.
This rhythm represents my heart skipping a beat as we walk down 63rd Street. You don't say your word, you're playing it so cool, so much so that it is kind of cruel. As we're walking towards the Lincoln, and I can't guess what you're thinking. You hungry? No, I'm okay. The walls are looking down at this puny little pair, wondering why we are even there. Don't we know our place? We haven't made it yet. We're both broke and we're both placing bets as we're getting to the Lincoln and the wind. About that place it looks nice. A little fancy, no? I got this. You came here alone. Well, that's a problem solved. I think is that revolving door revolves. Seeing you spinning, reflected in the glass. A million moving images of you pass as we spin into the lake. My stomach started sinking. I take a look at the menu, and it hurts. I say, okay, and then you say, we're the only two collared shirts in a sea of tuxes. Sorry if I am staring, I don't mean to make you insecure. It's just that I've never seen the one before. I've been looking around at every passing face, not even sure what I am looking for in the first place. For someone to match up. And make me skip a beat Who doesn't give a shit what we eat So funny that we'd meet In the center of the Lincoln Where my heart started thinking What do you want to do now? I don't care. Thank you. So did you ever get to eat at the Lincoln? No. <laughs> oh. Does everybody know what the Lincoln is? What? What the Lincoln is. It's like the restaurant when you walk into Lincoln Square, which is, you know, the most romantic place in the world. And I really thought I was, I was gonna like lay down some Prince Charming that night, and uh, couldn't afford it. <laughs> it worked out anyway, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It worked out. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so, do you always write on guitar? Uh, I tr I try to split um, sort of what the song calls for. I mean, I, I definitely have more um, dexterity on the guitar, but uh, I like the piano too. Do you, is there a difference between what you pick up when you're working on a theater piece? Do you go straight to one or? I feel like it does, it sort of dictate, uh, hopefully the song or the situation dictates. And also I think, you know, writers know this, that your hands go to certain places more easily depending on what you're, you know, uh, Does that happen here with. too? Yeah, certainly. I mean, a lot of those chords, I feel like Charlie Rosen's here. He's like, oh, Nick's using those chords again. Um, uh, but yeah, I think like, you know, there's a, a bass and I try to push myself out of it, uh, but they're different. So um, hopefully the songs, you know, spread a wide, cast a wider net that way through two instruments. Do you ever do the Joni Mitchell retuning thing? I, I try it. I like, I totally believe in it, but I don't know how she gets back. I just feel like I like go and then I'm like, oh, I'm in drop H, you know, it's just like never, never to return. 
Um, was it, did you, were you challenged by this assignment? Very much. I mean, I, I immediately when Lonnie asked, um, I, the situation popped into my head, but it's, you know, because I, I just got married, it sort of was like a daunting task to try to sum up, you know, the, the moment that I sort of realized that this girl was right for me. Um, and I think that it's sort of a similar thing that what Justin was saying about, you know, you, is the is the moment worthy of a song, and the the little hook the da, da, ca got like, caught in my head, and I was like, okay, okay. Right. Sometimes you know, sometimes the song sort of like writes itself, and then you have to fill in the the pieces to make it connect. Now, by saying that that hook, that musical hook, got in your head, are, does that mean are, are you a music first person? Uh, I I feel like it it again depends. I think sometimes. I'll come up with like a, a rhyme scheme that I think is interesting and I'd love to see if I can play it out over the course of the song and fulfill it. Uh, and this one, it was about, you know, can it be a short chorus that actually, you know, is that sort of innocuous? And then like, can, can that add up to the feeling of, of like seeing the one or whatever? Well done. Thank you, sir. Peter Mills is a Donna Parrott Rosen Award, Cole Porter Award, Kleban Prize, and Fred Ebb Award winning composer and lyricist. He is a 2006 Drama Desk Award nominee for his musical, The Pursuit of Persephone. Peter is a founding member of the Prospect Theater Company and is currently writing the lyrics to the Broadway-aimed musical, The Honeymooners. He is joined tonight by my very good friend and one of my favorite performers, David Perlman. Here is David singing Pete's song live from Lincoln Center with Pete at the piano. I've been debating whether this song requires setup I think I'm going to err on the side of less and just say that this is in the category of fiction. Jeff mentioned the categories, uh, so this is fiction. <sighs> take a moment, take it in, center stage at the Met. This is so much further than I ever thought I would get. I can't believe I'm standing here where legends of greatness surround me and something whistles past my ear. A knife. Audra McDonald has found me. How did it come to this? How did things go amiss? I blame reality TV. Not even PBS could buck the trend, I guess. Gotta give the people what the people wanna see. Weekly ratings in a downward spiral. Change the format so the clips go viral. Add up grit, a brud of grit, and viral. Make them tune in, they said, and look where it led. Now I'm a predator here, unwilling volunteer, caught in a sick and twisted scheme. On this so-called highbrow show called Live from Lincoln Center, my nightmare's just begun. I'm being hunted down by artists of renown. It's like the Hunger Games dressed up in an evening gown. Woe to those who enter. Very few of us will survive tonight's performance in a world of torments that they call Lincoln Center Live. Oh no. Pursued by Kevin Klein, and here comes James Levine. He's got a poison-tipped baton. 
duck a deadly blow from Yo-Yo's cello bow. Dodge the razor and talons of a balancing black swan. In the shadow of these cultural palaces, I stand stricken by a strange paralysis. Right in front of me are four Marsalises. There's Jason on the drums, Delfeo on trombone, Branford on the tenor sax, and Winton with a battle axe. And as the body count begins to mount and mount until it turns the fountain red, I start to doubt I'll make it out alive from Lincoln Center, where bloodshed is an art. That's their tagline. With every bated breath, I sense approaching death. Who's that encroaching? Holy crap, it's Kristen Chenoweth. She's tiny but ferocious. She's a terror at four foot five. Please, Miss Flaming, why are you condemning me to die at Lincoln Center Live? I brought this punishment on myself, I know. Still, it seems a little bit much for texting at a show. I wonder what President Lincoln himself would say. He'd probably say, what better way to honor a guy who got off that a play? Inside these hallowed halls, where once they hung Chagall's, now countless hangings have occurred. And Avery Fisher's scene, unsavory vicious scenes, worse than when the Philharmonic butchered Mahler's third. No more arias performed by Leontine. Last week's episode, she caught a fleantine. Dragged him screaming to Josh Groban's guillotine. In Damrush Park, they've jumped the shark live from Lincoln Center. Oh, what has art become? A program this obscene should not be on the screen. Though to be fair, it's not the worst thing airing on 13. If somehow I survive this, I'm gonna pass at the next pledge drive. I don't support the pure class warfare this show promotes, where the high and mighty crush the common folks. Brought to you, as always, by the Cokes once again. It's Lincoln Center Live. Wow, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> A medal to David, who learned that in like one day and yes. has a million words. That is a so. good place to start. <laughs> As usual, so smart and funny and original. Where, where did that come from? Uh, well, there were various influences. It was the first idea I had, and maybe because I knew the show would be around Halloween time. Uh, I'm also <laughs> working on another show right now that is about a murderer, so I may have been in a certain mindset, but it was the first idea I had, and then I thought, of course, I won't actually do that one. But then I, I sort of ran out of time and had to, had to work on that one, because <laughs> uh, it was the, the only one I'd started. So. You're incredible. I feel like you write a show a week. Am I wrong? Used to, used to. Uh, not quite as prolific in, in recent years, but yeah, there was a period there where I was doing a new show. These were off-off-Broadway shows, but we were doing a, a new show almost every year. Unbelievable. Now, how, like a song like this, what what are we talking about time-wise? Um, well, like I said, I had the idea way back when Lonnie asked us all. Way uh, back when last month? Uh, was, it, was it? Okay. Uh, and and fall is, is like the busiest time for me work-wise, so it had to get squeezed in and the, the off hours or whatever. But I would just be thinking about it on train rides or whatever. And I don't know, somehow it eventually happened. But it was not one, it did not happen in one stretch of inspiration. Yeah. And sometimes it does? Sometimes, yeah. No, this one was chipped away at and eventually finished, yeah. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's incredible. Um, some of those rhymes. <laughs> do you have to reach for those or do they just? No, for, I mean, for me, rhyming, like, that's, that's the easier place to go. So in terms of thinking of, like, a Lincoln Center comedy song, I start being like, what would be fun to rhyme? So, um, and that was actually a way into the song to just take some of those Lincoln Center celebrities and see what are the possibilities here. Do you have a, a, a penchant for reality TV and or the Hunger Games? I don't. I, I really, I feel like 
I was, I've been waiting for the reality TV like trend to end forever now, and I thought it was going to, and it, and it never did. No, I don't. And now you're making it last longer. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I was waiting for the d joke dead from Lincoln Center. I, I, my wife suggested that, that I retitle it that. Well, because both, both people who had heard this song, both Lonnie and David, like they, their first reaction was like, I love it. I didn't understand it when I heard it. And, and so I think it does, like, it's a little confusing or disorienting when you, when you hear it. And uh, my wife had suggested, well, what if you called it dead from Lincoln Center? People might be clued in a little bit more. But anyway. <laughs> it's really, it's so clever and uh, it's an amazing piece of writing. Congratulations. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Up next, we have Ryan Scott Oliver, a Jonathan Larson Grant recipient, Richard Rogers Award winner, New Horizons Award winner, ASCAP Harold Adamson Lyric Award winner, Lortel Award nominee. <laughs> Couldn't resist. And a Dramatist Guild Fellow. You won enough awards, I can make that joke, right? Okay. Um, his musical Jasper in Deadland premiered to a sold-out run off-Broadway in 2014 and was subsequently performed at the Fifth Avenue Theater. A collection of his work, rated RSO, played the Kennedy Center, Joe's Pub, and the New York Musical Theater Festival. He is the director of new musicals at Pace University and the artistic director of the Pasadena Musical Theater Program. Tonight, he is accompanied by Rodney Bush. Here is Ryan Scott Oliver singing The Picture in His Head. Um, when uh, Lonnie gave us the prompt to write a song about Lincoln Center, I naturally consulted my husband, because that's what you do when you're married. And he was like, well, why don't you write a song about me? Because um, I was like, I haven't done that enough already. And, uh, but I realized that Matt actually had a really interesting story about Lincoln Center and his time here um, as a professional ballet dancer and uh, all of the events that occurred afterwards. So this song uh, is called New Pictures. Matthew always dreamed of dancing with ABT. That is, of course, American Ballet Theater, which I thought was a college because I'm dumb. He'd studied since a kid and worked his ass off. And then it happened. It all happened. He had this picture in his head of dancing at the Met. And by 17, he joined that scene in tights and t-shirts stained with sweat. Building stacks of broken shoes. Every day, a brand new bruise. A life's goal attained so fast. But what's a dream to do when it's finished coming true? The picture of his life didn't, couldn't last. Cause the picture in your head never ends like you'd expect. And four years in, a room starts to spin. He stays home sick, his body wrecked. Sure he thought a minor bug, but after weeks and still a slug, the docs call it Epstein Bar. Goodbye to dreams of ballet star. Goodbye, goodbye. He was lost, everything he worked for gone. All the pieces smashed asunder. Took 18 months to wonder what would he do now? What would he do? Just a shred. He was jobless with no hope. But that wasn't him. And so, on a whim, he bought a camera just to cope. Slow at first, but then some speed. He knew the passion it took to feed a skill, whether dance or art. He knew how much time, how much heart, and he was found. Suddenly the work came fast. Put 
putting pieces back in position, reigniting old ambition. He was an artist once again. And how, and how we have his picture by our bed of him dancing at the Met. But now he shoots the shows and Broadway knows he's the go-to guy, good as they get. He taught me life may change your heart, but it can never change your heart. The real test he came to see. The picture of your life may fade, but the point is new pictures get made. He made new in his new life with me. Hey, dude. Nice. Huh? Of course, he's not here. He isn't. He's no longer with us. Oh, no. <laughs> no. That's that Epstein dark. bar, that lethal Epstein bar. I'm the bar. disease tonight. You know, yeah, absolutely. Epstein bar is really hard to like set to music. Like all diseases. Like how do you like set that to music? But that's the way you do it. Um, he's on a plane right now. Yeah. yeah. So did he really say write a song about me? Yeah, he actually. I was like, I wanted to do because um, it's really when I come to see the theater, it's like. It's, I always feel like I'm a little bit at work because my mind I'm thinking about so much. And so it's a rare time when I actually get to shut my brain off and just like enjoy the thing and like not be like a participant in it. And there was that um, Danny Elfman's music, uh, the films of Tim Burton that just happened at Avery Fisher Hall. And when I saw that, I was like, oh my God. So when Lonnie sent that, I was like, oh, I should write that about that. But then Matt was like, no, me. <laughs> it's like, great. Okay, so, so how does that work? Does he get um, approval? I mean, did you have to run <laughs> versions past him? Yeah, I absolutely. I had to first approve it through him, and then he had to send it to his mother no. to see <laughs> if she would cry, and she did. So I was like, great, we're ready. Is she always the barometer for much, uh, emotional yeah. writing? For, mm -hmm, for feelings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Can I have her number? Totally, absolutely. <laughs> He actually, um, I like, I interviewed him a little bit um, for, and so a number of a uh, number of the lyrics are actually directly from him. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I made them rhyme, but like. <laughs> <laughs> I had to see. Like, I heard the song. Uh, uh, actually, I read the lyric, and I had a secret fantasy that um, it was going to be a surprise for him. But no, Aww. he 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 ordered it. I've literally surprised him. When we first started dating, I, I wrote a song uh, for him called The Seraph, and I like sent it to him, like me singing it. And we had been dating for like two weeks, and he was so creeped out by it <laughs> um, that I, that, so like I learned my lessons. Like I like always prepped him on like all the songs I would write about him. That's hysterical. Yeah. Um, what else do you want to tell me? <laughs> What do you want to tell me? How are you doing? Don't, this isn't about me. The last <laughs> one was about me. <laughs> you sound like my husband. Do I? I, I think bit. that's good, though. He's that nice. Totally and good. he's a very talented photographer, by he the way. He is very. He's good. Yeah. He's a good guy. Um, I'm just going to ask you, because it's just something I'm always curious yeah. about. Music first, lyrics first, or combo platter? So this actually, lyric was first, right? But then I asked him like what some like up-tempo ballet music was that he remembered went from his time here, and he mentioned Swan Lake. So like the, are you still here, Rodney? No, Rodney left. You were, you're great. Um, uh, like the, the intro was like uh, the Swan, a uh, movement from Swan Lake, and then the chord progression for the, the verse was something, was the, the mandolin dance from uh, Romeo and Juliet. That's great. I love. I love the like. I didn't catch them because I guess I'm not. I mean, I'd never heard them before no, until I like researched. No, them. but that's always so cool when you like kind of hide these little secret goodies that's in there. Yeah. yeah. Any other secret goodies we should know about? Um, no, you got all the goodies. That was all the goodies. Thank you. Thanks. Great job. Joe, I, I broke everything. Um, Joe Iconis is a composer, lyricist, book writer, and performer. Among his writing credits are the musicals Be More Chill, Blood Song of Love, The Black Suits, and the Exploitation Action Musical, Annie Golden, Bounty Hunter, Yo. Is that about the actress, Annie Golden? Amazing. His concert act 
Joe Iconis and family, frequently plays the Beachman Theater, 54 Below, and Joe's Pub. He's been nominated for two Drama Desk Awards, a Lucille Lortel Award, and is the recipient of an Ed Kleban Award, a Jonathan Larson Award, and a Doris Duke Grant. His songs are featured on season two of NBC's Smash. He is joined tonight by members of the Iconis family, Rob Rakiki on guitar and Jason Sweet Tooth Williams on tambourine. Here they are singing 64, the Iconis Family Singers. Hey, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, yeah, uh, well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I have to say, I'm very honored to be here tonight. And um, of all, of all the atriums I've ever played, <laughs> this, this atrium is one of the best atriums. <laughs> um, so, so, so listen, guys. Uh, um, uh, Lonnie, uh, Lonnie said to me that he wanted me to say a few words before this song. Um, uh, so I'm, so I'm doing that. These are my few words that I'm saying right now. And um, my, my song. Uh, in it, I sort of reference uh, a couple establishments that were in this area that no longer exist. I also reference um, a couple actors who are no longer with us, who did some shows at Lincoln Center. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say the names of those places because you're going to hear them in the song, but I just want to let you know that if you, uh, if you hear the names of these places and you're like, where the hell is that, uh, and you're confused, it's okay. It's totally cool. <laughs> Uh, I think you're going to be fine, and um, and I'll just say that the the song is sort of inspired by um, you know when you like, you know when you when you like walk down the street and um, you pass a storefront and the storefront is like a brand new bank, and you say to yourself, oh wow, a new bank. What used to be there? I can't, I can't like quite remember what used to be there. Uh, whatever like that feeling is is what I think uh, the song is about. I stand on 64 in the middle of the fall, right outside the diner from Annie Hall, or where it used to be. Anyhow, PJ Clark's I see is what's there now. I dream about a time many years ago where I could drink at McHale's and sober up at a show at the Hellinger or the original Helen Hayes, back when things were better in many ways. I walk toward Lincoln Center now, just like I did when I was a kid. At least we still got one thing that looks the way it did. When life was unsafe and whoa so hectic and not so oh so antiseptic, they tell you that it's better now, but don't you let them fool ya. Cause after all, it's safer for you to walk to school But you'll never ever be as cool as Raul Julia Heading to rehearsal in the fall Cause New York at the moment is a troubling place I recognize its heart, but I can't make sense of its face. There's no Hawaii Kai, there's just Applebee's, and I can't identify with Applebee's. I think about my life in the theater, and then I think of how much easier it must have been when people understood courage pays off in spades when this neighborhood was full of renegades. I'm walking up the steps now, and with each step I feel the history and the legacy 
Oh, when the theater and the city were real. When it was unsafe and woe so hectic and not so oh so antiseptic. They tell you that it's better now. But honey, let me school ya. Cause after all, you think that you're just where you wanna be. But you will never, ever be as free as Raul Julia. Heading to rehearsal in the fall. Oh, 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 Raul Julia. Heading to rehearsal in the fall. Oh, take me back to the way back when. Cause I know that life was better then. Take me back to the way back when, and you'll never hear me ask again. It's 1976 in the middle of the fall. I'm on 64 and walk to the rehearsal hall. I'm Raul Julia. <laughs> so heading to rehearsals, what I do. I walk up the steps, I get a little chill As I think about the neighborhood of San Juan Hill How they knocked it down, swept it all away To build this town where I'ma do my play Change is good, but at what price? Sometimes I'm just not sure I know we're better for the progress made but I still dream of when the city was pure When it was unsafe and oh so hectic Undeveloped and eclectic Better now or better then And how do you compare? Cause after all I see the fountain And pride fills up my chest But will I ever feel as wild west? Cause Jose Ferrer heading to rehearsal in the fall Rehearsal in the fall. Oh, it wasn't all perfect. Last I checked, I know that things look different in retrospect. And with every cause come so many effects. Good Lord, nostalgia's so complex. But when Raul Julia was walking to rehearsal in the fall, it must have been the only good time to be alive in the city at all. Take me back to the way back when Cause I know that life was better then Take me back to the way back when And you'll never hear me ask again To take me back to the way back when Cause I know that life was better then Take me back to the way back when And you'll never hear me ask again To take me to the way back when Jason Sweet Tooth Williams, Rob Rokicki. That was great. You really captured that thing. That's, I mean, that's such a great idea. What am I trying to say? I don't so know. there's that, <laughs> like, the, you know, we, we do this, like you're saying, you walk past the bank, and mm -hmm. we always have this sort of kind of complaint, and just you, th that you're singing about Raul Julia, and Raul Julia is singing about Jose Ferrer. It's brilliant. Thanks. <laughs> How'd you come up? Well, how, now, why them? Why them? Um, you know, it was, uh, I, um, I, I definitely feel this sort of like conflicted 
um, the, the conflicted thoughts about nostalgia that are expressed in the song. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm like a New Yorker born and bred, and so I, I love the city so much, like so passionately I love it. Um, but I'm, and, and I constantly find myself in that place that I think most New Yorkers are, where it's like, oh, the city is, the city is great, but it's like not what it used to be. Um, and it's hard to not feel like that. Um, but I, I feel like people have always felt like that, you know, and of course it's like a scary time now, it seems like, but maybe it always was a scary time. I don't know, which is just to say that I just think the idea of Raul Julia um, sort of walking through the plaza of Lincoln Center to go to like rehearsal for Three Penny Opera seems like the coolest thing I could ever possibly imagine. And, um, and that just that image of him like sort of like bundled up walking to rehearsal felt like um, for me a great, uh, a great sort of random uh, notion to sort of symbolize this idea of romanticizing a, a time before I was around. Yeah, I was gonna say you couldn't possibly have seen that. Um, I, I didn't, but... Uh, but the poster's famous, The right? poster's great. Yeah. <laughs> what a poster, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, I was really, I was really curious, because all your references, they were sort of my, my references, mm -hmm. or even like before mine, and I know mm -hmm. you're younger than I am. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I just, I love, I, I love the, the history of New York City and of the, this area and the theater district in general, and so, um, e even though New York has changed a lot since I was a kid uh, in the 80s, I felt, still found myself like longing for this time that I was not around for, you know, and sort of romanticizing um, the, you know, the sort of like New York of the, the 70s and 60s and 50s and 40s, which I think is really easy to do when you're not, when you were a person who didn't actually have to live through it, you know? What are your favorite Lincoln Center memories from when you were a kid? Oh my goodness, I saw, uh, I saw the Carousel production that was really great. My actually, like my, my number one memory about that is that I, so I saw Carousel at the, the Beaumont, and it's like one of like the, the most beautiful productions of all time, everybody loves it, and I, I saw it, and then uh, I was in like a theater summer camp, and- um, Which the, one? Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was called Bosies on Long Island. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wish it was a good one but it, it wasn't, <laughs> it was a terrible summer camp. I, no, it wasn't, it was a perfectly fine summer camp. At any rate, we, there was like a summer camp trip to go to see a show in the city, and we could have gone to see, um, uh, uh, I believe it was Carousel or Big the Musical, um, and I ended up going to see Big the Musical, and I was bummed about it. That's such a weird story to tell. I actually like Big the Musical a lot. Hey, everybody. But wait. <laughs> But then, but then you're saying you corrected it afterwards and you actually finally did get to see Carousel. Um, I, I had seen Carousel oh, already. already? Oh, yeah. you wanted to see, you should have seen it again. I should have seen saying. it again, but I also, yeah. I also saw Big already. That's so like, I feel like in the history, in the history of anecdotes that have been told in the atrium, that has to be one of the worst anecdotes <laughs> anyone has ever We better attempted. fix that with a good one, quick. Yeah, yeah. Go. Um, I thought that Parade was pretty good. <laughs> you could do a lot worse than Parade. That it's was nice. That's so true. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank job. you. <laughs> Bye. Next, we have the songwriting team of Kate Kerrigan and Brian Loudermilk. They made, woo! They made their off Broadway debut with the adaptation of Henry and Mudge, which is still touring nationally. Together, they have received the Larson Award and Dramatist Guild Fellowship. Independently, Kate has received the Kleban Award for libretto writing, and Brian has received the Richard Rogers Award. They have held residencies at the Orchard Project, the Johnny Mercer Writers Colony at Goodspeed Musicals, Rhinebeck Writers Retreat, and the McDowell Arts Colony. And now I'm going off book because I also want to acknowledge Brian and Kate for creating new musical theater, newmusictheater.com. Newmusicaltheater.com, which is the foremost place to find sheet music for writers like the ones you're hearing tonight. It was their brainchild, and thank you for making that possible for us writers and also for all the musical th theater performers out there. Um, Tonight, you are very lucky because you are uh, going to be treated to a performance by the incredible Tony Award winner, Alice Ripley. Here she is singing Brian and Kate's song, Ghost Light.
was kind of a graceful entrance. <laughs> ah. This song is epic. It really does fit that word. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that I get to sing this one tonight.
Thank you. Amazing, Alice. And you guys, Kate, can you get up here? Can I help you? <laughs> we don't want Kate's water to break because she's having a baby. She's due on Sunday. Yay! I didn't think I'd be here. <laughs> Amazing. Can I, what can I do? I feel like I should be handing you things. I'm good. I'm fine. You are? Yeah. Can you come downstage a little bit yes, more? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. So, I love songs about the theater written by theater writers. That's what we wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, um, so can you tell me what, it, what, 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 what happened? You got that call and then? We got that call um, and we were like, this is awesome, we're gonna do something fantastic. Then we forgot about it for a while because we had a lot of things we were trying to kick out before Kate's daughter is born, maybe <laughs> tonight. And, um, <laughs> and then Kate, I think you had just been like brainstorming some words or phrases maybe yeah, on the subway. Yeah, we started out trying to come up with story ideas and then we finally, we hit on the idea of, um, we started talking about how many great performances there were at Lincoln Center and these, these iconic performances and that sense of, I, I'm, really, I'm really enamored with the moment after a show ends when you walk out on stage and the ghost light is still on and there's nothing else. Um, so we started talking about that idea and trying to figure out if we could make that, take those two ideas, someone who, like an iconic performance, that sense of, um, one of the greats on the stage with this idea of a ghost light and something that doesn't, that remains even after the theater is dark. Were you inspired by a particular performer or performance? I mean, did you have someone in mind, maybe even our singer tonight? We're very happy to have us <laughs> yeah, sing that song. Yeah, it no, it was mostly that Kate said the words ghost light. And we said, and and I said, oh no! Um, I said, well, we 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 have to write that song, and also that's going to be like, that's going to be a little battle of a song to write, because you want it to, if you're going to write a song about what a ghost light is, um, you you want it to go that far. You want us that we were trying to write something where we were putting into a song what it means to us to be a theater artist with legs and to be someone who's building a body of work that you're hoping is going to stand the test of time. Uh, and that's a that's a hard thing to squeeze into a song. Uh, so Kate's been <laughs> writing been away on the away subway. At <laughs> Are you guys always uh, one order first? Oh, no. First? No, we're no. very, it's very mishmashed. We've so gotten really sloppy in the yeah. past couple years, just back and forth and back and forth. So I, like, I, I came up with sort of a chorus, or I came up with a couple different sections of the song, and then Brian took it and turned it into music, which then had nothing to do with what I'd written for the most part. Um, and then I went back and wrote some lyrics to that, and then we changed the sketch again, and. We go back and forth a lot. And is this happening in your respective homes, or do you have a do you work in the same room? We go back and forth. We work together in a room sometimes, and uh, but a lot of the drafts go back and forth via email. We work in Evernote a lot. Oh yeah, we really I like that. We use a lot of apps and things. I sing terrible, terrible, screaming high notes into my iPhone, and then I send it to poor Kate and also to like Lonnie. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Alice thankfully didn't ever hear my like crazy belted B flats. He You're sang it you in her key. Out. I did sing it in her key. It's glorious. <laughs> um, I have one last question for you guys. So, so you wrote the song, and then Alice Ripley is going to sing it. Is there any tailoring that happens then, or does she, is she singing the final piece? Do you, you mean? Yeah, you know, like uh, I mean, does what? Once we knew that Alice was singing it, the, um, the stakes went up for us a little bit. Yep. And so we got really <laughs> nervous and we decided it needed to be like really good when we were trying to make something like pretty good. <laughs> we, had, we had a couple really anxious phone calls with each other about that. Yep. <laughs> we did a couple more polishes than we might have otherwise. <laughs> well, I, I just want to say um, someday when you are old enough to play Norma Desmond, I think they should interpolate this song into the yeah, score. Perfect. Great job. Thanks, you guys. And good luck to you. Thank you. I'm helping you down. I don't care what you say. <laughs> She's amazing. Whatever. It's our last song. To close out our evening, we have Robert Friedman and John Bayless. 
collaborating together again after nearly 30 years. Robert is a Fred Ebb, Kleban, and Tony Award winner for the hit musical, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder. And if you, and if you haven't seen it, you just have a few more months, and it's so good, you have to catch it. He is Emmy and Writers Guild nominated for the television miniseries, Life with Judy Garland, Me and My Shadows. John, an accomplished pianist and performer, has appeared in concerts worldwide, including at Carnegie Hall, the Hollywood Bowl, London's Barbican Center, and Lincoln Center's Avery F David Geffen Hall. <laughs> Singing their song is the incredible Tyler Maynard. In a town nearby Amarillo, I lay down with my stuffed armadillo. Mother closed the light, and I dream each night that I'd fly away from there on my pillow. Daddy sold four trucks like a preacher to afford all the bucks for my teacher. I was so at ease at the ivories that at church I became a Sunday feature. And though they mocked me in the schoolyard, I said with my hands upon my hips, toodaloo, I'm on my way to Juilliard. Oh, how could I have known then the seeds that would be sown then when I was to enter the halls of Lincoln Center on the night, on the night, on the night that Lenny kissed me on the lips. Must have been an object of pity when I first arrived in the city. So naive and green, I was just 18, and now certain men were calling me pretty. I had come to learn from the masters, but the voice in my head was my pastor's. Walk the narrow path, or the god of wrath will smite you with a host of disasters. And so I avoided all temptation, though I may have made a couple slips. I shied away from demonstrations of any strong emotion or intimate devotion. I was not expecting, completely unsuspecting, on that night, on the night, on the night that Lenny kissed me on the lips. I was so excited I got into his master class. Oh, the man, the legend, he was God to us. And oh, and yell and scream and cuss and oh he had his favorites we all could see i was no special friend no no not me so my parents came that christmas to new york city for the first time and i took them straight to avery fisher hall for my folks new york's main attraction was to see leonard bernstein in action with his tailcoat on and his death baton, he conjured quite a thrilling attraction. I wanted to, to meet my parents, so we arrived backstage with elation to express our complete adoration. 
with a warm embrace. Lenny clutch my face and consigned me to eternal damnation. My parents witnessed something shocking for which they'd have to come to grips. This wasn't a friendly peck we're talking. This kind of pushy friendship, this wet and mushy blendship for such a very young man. You see, he slipped me the tongue, man. On the night, on the night, on the night that Lenny kissed me on the lips. We haven't talked about it since. In the years since then, I've kissed many other men, but I must admit my heart still skips when I suddenly remember that evening in December we made a deep connection. I felt so much affection. And maybe his. On the night. On the night. On the night that Lenny kissed me. And the night John kissed you on the lips. <laughs> yeah, I got it. That was good. Um, hi. Good. We need a mic for you. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff. <laughs> um, great song, you guys. Thank you. So wait, 30 years? Yeah. Collaborated at one time? Um, and then 30 years passed? Say more. We met. Um, we were in the first class of the graduate musical theater writing program at NYU at wow. the Tisch School of the Arts. Legacy. And we wrote a show together. We wrote several songs together. We wrote a show together. And um, the last time we wrote something new together was about 32 30. years ago. Yeah. So he's been busy. I've been busy. Uh, but when Lonnie called and said, you know, will you write a song, you can pick any composer you want. So, of course, I called John. Ah, that's so sweet. sweet. I love it. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, a little birdie told me that some of this may be true for both of you. A boy never tells. <laughs> Tonight he does. <laughs> Come on, John. What? Huh? What did you say? I said, come on, oh, give it up. Um, give it up in front of all these people and cameras and everything. No, um, I met uh, the maestro in 1978 on our birthday. We share the same birthday, August 25th. And I met him in Washington. I was 22, he was 60. And we had a wonderful relationship it's incredible until he passed away. And uh, I assistant conducted his mass in London and played all the stuff. And the first record, record I ever made on Angel Records uh, was called Bayless Meets Bernstein, West Side Story Variations. So I took all of the variations, the beautiful th songs from West Side Story and reimagined them as Brahms, Mahler, Beethoven. There is a three variations on America. The first one is Scarlatti. And the second one is Bluesy and Brassy. And the third is in the style of Beethoven. And uh, 
He liked those. <laughs> well, I should say that Leonard Bernstein was one of our teachers right. at NYU. And um, we um, often reminisce about those days and often reminisce about our experiences with Leonard Bernstein. And one of the things that we shared was um, he threw a party for our group um, in his uh, apartment in the Dakota. And some of us stayed really late because uh, he was an insomniac. And he just wanted to keep the party going and keep talking. And we were in a small group. And John already knew him really well. I had not ever met him until that class started. And um, as he said goodbye to everyone, he kissed everybody on the lips in a very mushy way <laughs> that you couldn't really forget. And I was, I think I was 23, and I had moved to New York from Los Angeles, and it was snowing, and I was walking from the Dakota to the subway. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and the snow was falling, Beautiful. and I just thought, this is my life. <laughs> Leonard Bernstein kissed me on the lips, and it, I was in the Dakota, and it's snowing. And Anyway, um, but I knew uh, that John had uh, an, a better story than that. And, but he told him about, he told me about um, when he brought uh, his parents to meet Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, and we were in Dallas, and, and uh, um, there was, they weren't letting all these people back, but we got back, my parents, my sister, my brother, um, and he plants a big one. And my father, you know, had never seen me kiss anybody, <laughs> let alone a man, a famous man. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother, you know, being the, uh, the good Southern Baptist lady that she is, kind of rolled her eyes. But they never talked about it. And <laughs> I don't know that's about well, it. He, he, did, uh, he did slip one of our classmates the tongue well, that the night. Tongue, but yeah. I won't mention any names. Just a very well-known, successful uh, Broadway book writer. But not... not uh, not you? Here, not here tonight. Yeah, not here tonight. No. No. The, the, there was a the famous a little story. Um, Irving Berlin's hundredth birthday at Carnegie Hall, um, but he was he wasn't there. Irving, Irving wasn't, and um, but Rosemary Clooney and Tony Bennett were there singing and doing their their stuff, and <laughs> Tony Bennett said, "Rosie." did you see Lenny? She said, did I see him? He kissed me. And Tony Bennett said, did he give you the tongue? <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> I hesitate to interject because I feel like we just get so much good gossip if I just let you guys talk all night. <laughs> but um, let me ask you one final question. So um, were you, I, I, I heard this, uh, was, this entire collaboration happened over email. Pretty much. I mean, it's pretty funny because we hadn't written together in so long, but it's like, you know, uh, getting back on the bike and stuff. It just happened easily. And um, we first talked on the phone and came up with the idea, and then uh, we had the hook, the night letting him kiss me on the lips, and, and then John spent some time coming up with the music, and he recorded it and sent it to me. And then I wrote some lyrics, and I sent them back to him, and we went back and forth like that, and we texted. And um, I had planned, he lives in Palm Springs, and I had planned to go there, and we just ran out of time. So we never actually got the song together until we rehearsed until with we Tyler. Rehearsed with Tyler, thank on you Sunday. so much. And it, and it worked, thank you. Thank which you. was amazing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Tyler, you're fantastic. I'd also like to say that, that the, the um, Everybody always asks who writes it first and who does. Robert and I have done it several ways, but the most, um, I think, effective or um, meaningful way is if I come, we come up with a title, he comes up with a title, and I try to fit that title in somewhere and kind of let it, you know, muck around in the brain and then go to the piano and play. As a lyricist, I get inspired by music. It's not that I can't write the lyrics first, but when I don't, I find that I write better stuff when I'm inspired by music. I, I always say that as a composer. 
<laughs> um, thank you guys. It's a great, a wonderful song, and I love that it, it touches on both of your experiences. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. On behalf of Lonnie Price and Matt Coward, I'd like to thank Godfrey Palaya, Jordan Pacumpi, Jordana Pacumpi, Tom Dunn, Jillian Campbell, and the staff of the David Rubenstein Atrium. And to our amazing artists and performers, thank you all so much for your incredible talent and creativity. And we hope to see you all back here on Friday, November 6th for a very special Artist to Artist, which will feature Golden Globe winner and Tony nominee Gabriel Byrne in conversation with up-and-coming actor Will Rogers at 7.30, followed by our first ever After Hours Salon series hosted by maestro Alan Gilbert at 10.30, right here at the Atrium. Thanks again for coming out tonight.